he was insane. Even so, I wasn't prepared for what came next. Nobody was. Solemn, humorless, despite the slightly ironic smile, he suddenly cut deep, yet with the same mildness, the same almost inhuman indifference, except for the pale flash of fire in his eyes. Neither Brecca nor you ever fought such battles, he said. I don't boast much of that. Nevertheless, I don't recall hearing any glorious deeds of yours, except that you murdered your brothers. You'll prowl the stalagmites of hell for that, friend Unferth, clever though you are. The hall was numb. The stranger was no player of games. And yet he was shrewd, you had to grant. Whether or not they believed his wild tale of superhuman strength, no thane in the hall would attack him again and risk the slash of that mild, coolly murderous tongue. Old King Hrothgar, for one, was pleased. The madman's single-mindedness would be useful in a monster fight. He spoke. Where's the queen? We're all friends in this hall. Let her come to us and pass the bowl. She must have been listening behind her door. She came out, radiant, and crossed swiftly to the great golden bowl on the table by the hearth. As if she'd brought light and warmth with her, men began talking, joking, laughing, both Danes and Gaiats together. When she'd served all the Danes and the lesser Gaiats, she stood, red hair flowing, her neck and arms adorned in gold, by the leader of the strangers. I thank God, she said, that my wish has been granted, that at last I have found a man whose courage I can trust. The stranger smiled, glanced at Unferth. Hrothgar's top man had recovered a little, though his neck was still dark red. We'll see, the stranger said. And again, I found something peculiar happening to my mind. His mouth did not seem to move with his words, and the harder I stared at his gleaming shoulders, the more uncertain I was of their shape. The room was full of a heavy, unpleasant scent I couldn't place. I labored to remember something, twisted roots, an abyss. I lose it. The queer little spasm of terror passes. Except for his curious beardlessness, there is nothing frightening about the stranger. I've broken the backs of bulls no weaker than he is. Hrothgar made speeches, his hand on the queen's. Unferth sat perfectly still, no longer blushing. He was struggling to make himself hope for the stranger's success, no doubt. Heroism is more than noble language, dignity. Inner heroism, that's the trick. Glorious carbuncle of the soul. Except in the life of the hero, the whole world's meaningless. He took a deep breath. He would try to be a better person, yes. He forced a smile, but it twisted out of his control. Tears. He got up suddenly and, without a word, walked out. Hrothgar told the hall that the stranger was like a son to him. The queen's smile was distant, and the nephew, Rothulf, picked at the table with a dirty fingernail. You already have more sons than you need, the queen laughed lightly. Hrothgar laughed, too, though he didn't seem to get it. He was tipsy. The stranger went on sitting with the same unlighted smile. The old king chatted of his plans for Freya Waru, how he would marry her off to his enemy, the king of the Heathobards. The stranger smiled on, but closed his eyes. 
He knew a doomed house when he saw it. I had a feeling. But for one reason or another he kept his peace. I grew more and more afraid of him, and at the same time, who can explain it, more and more eager for the hour of our meeting. The queen rose at last and retired. The fire in the hearth had now died down. The priests filed out to the god ring to do their devotions. Nobody followed. I could hear them in the distance, O oh, ghostly destroyer! The cold ring of gods stared inward with large, dead eyes. It is the business of rams to be rams, and of goats to be goats, the business of shapers to sing, and of kings to rule. The stranger waits on, as patient as a grave mound. I, too, wait, whispering, whispering, mad like him. Time grows, obeying its mechanics like all of us. So the young shaper observes, singing to the few who remain, fingertips troubling a dead man's harp. Frost shall freeze and fire melt wood. The earth shall give fruit and ice shall bridge dark water. Make roofs, mysteriously lock earth's flourishings. But the fetters of frost shall also fall. Fair weather return, and the reaching sun restore the restless sea. We wait. The king retires, and his people leave. The Gayats build up the fire, prepare to sleep. And now, silence, darkness, it is time. Chapter 12 I touch the door with my fingertips, and it bursts for all its fire-forged bands. It jumps away like a terrified deer, and I plunge into the silent hearth-lit hall with a laugh that I wouldn't much care to wake up to myself. I trample the planks that a moment before protected the hall like a hand raised in horror to a terrified mouth. Sheer poetry. Huh and the broken hinges rattle like swords down the timbered walls. The Gayats are stones, and whether it's because they're numb with terror or stiff from too much mead, I cannot tell. I am swollen with excitement, bloodlust, and joy, and a strange fear that mingle in my chest like the twisting rage of a bonfire. I step onto the brightly shining floor and angrily advance on them. They're all asleep, the whole company. I can hardly believe my luck, and my wild heart laughs, but I let out no sound. Swiftly, softly, I will move from bed to bed and destroy them all, swallow every last man. I am blazing, half crazy with joy. For pure mad prank, I snatch a cloth from the nearest table and tie it around my neck to make a napkin. I delay no longer. I seize up a sleeping man, tear at him hungrily, bite through his bone locks, and suck hot, slippery blood. He goes down in huge morsels, head, chest, hips, legs, even the hands and feet. My face and arms are wet, matted. The napkin is sopping. The dark floor steams. I move on at once, and I reach for another one, whispering, whispering, chewing the universe down to words. And I seize a wrist. A shock goes through me. Mistake. It's a trick. His eyes are open, were open all the time, cold-bloodedly watching to see how I work. The eyes nail me now as his hand nails down my arm. I jump back without thinking, whispering wildly, jump back without thinking. Now he's out of his bed. His hand still closed like a dragon's jaws on mine. Nowhere on Middle-earth, I realize, have I encountered a grip like his. 
my whole arms on fire, incredible, searing pain. It's as if his crushing fingers are charged like fangs with poison. I scream, facing him, grotesquely shaking hands. Dear long-lost brother, kinsman Thane, and the timbered hall screams back at me. I feel the bones go, ground from their sockets, and I scream again. I am suddenly awake. The long, pale dream, my history, falls away. The mead hall is alive. Great cavernous belly, gold-adorned, blood-stained, howling back at me, lit by the flickering fire in the stranger's eyes. He has wings. Is it possible? And yet it's true, out of his shoulders come terrible, fiery wings. I jerk my head, trying to drive out illusion. The world is what it is, and always was. That's our hope, our chance. Yet even in times of catastrophe, we people it with tricks. Grendel, Grendel, hold fast to what is true. Suddenly, darkness. My sanity has won. He's only a man. I can escape him. I plan. I feel the plan moving inside me like thaw-time waters rising between cliffs. When I'm ready... I give a ferocious kick, but something's wrong. I am spinning, whirr, falling through bottomless space, whirr, snatching at the huge twisted roots of an oak, a blinding flash of fire. No, darkness. I concentrate. I have fallen, slipped on blood. He viciously twists my arm behind my back. By accident it comes to me. I have given him a greater advantage. I could laugh. Whoa! Whoa! And now, something worse. He's whispering, spilling words like showers of sleet, his mouth three inches from my ear. I will not listen. I continue whispering. As long as I whisper myself, I need not hear. His syllables lick at me, chilly fire. His syllables lick at me. Chilly fire, his syllables lick at me. Chilly fire, his syllables lick. A meaningless swirl in the stream of time. A temporary gathering of bits. A few random specks, a cloud. Complexities, green dust, purple dust, gold. Additional refinements, sensitive dust. Copulating dust. The world is my bone cave I shall not want. He laughs as he whispers. I roll my eyes back. Flames slip out at the corners of his mouth. As you see it, it is. While the seeing lasts. Dark nightmare history. Time as coffin. But where the water was rigid, there will be fish, and men will survive on their flesh till spring. It's coming, my brother. Believe it or not, though you murder the world, turn plains to stone, transmogrify life into I and it, strong searching roots will crack your cave and rain will cleanse it. The world will burn green. Sperm, build again. My promise. Time is the mind, the hand that makes. Fingers on harp strings, hero swords, the acts, the eyes of queens. By that I kill you. I do not listen. I am sick at heart. I have been betrayed before by talk like that. Mama! I bawl. Shapes vague as lurking seaweed surround us. My vision clears. The stranger's companions encircle us, useless swords. I could laugh if it weren't for the pain that makes me howl. And yet I address him, whispering, whimpering, whining. If you win, 
It's by mindless chance. Make no mistake. First you tricked me, and then I slipped. Accident. He answers with a twist that hurls me forward, screaming. The fanes make way. I fall against a table and smash it, and wall timbers crack. And still he whispers, Grendel, Grendel, you make the world by whispers, second by second. Are you blind to that? Whether you make it a grave or a garden of roses is not the point. Feel the wall. Is it not hard? He smashes me against it, breaks open my forehead. Hard, yes. Observe the hardness. Write it down in careful runes. Now sing of walls. Sing, I howl. Sing, I'm singing. Sing words. Sing raving hymns. You're crazy! Ow! Sing! I sing of walls! I howl! Hooray for the hardness of walls! Terrible! He whispers. Terrible! He laughs, and lets out fire. You're crazy! I say. If you think I created that wall that cracked my head, you're a fucking lunatic! Sing walls! He hisses. I have no choice. The wall will fall to the wind, as the windy hill will fall, and all things thought in former times. Nothing made remains, nor man remembers, and these towns shall be called the shining towns. Better, he whispers. That's better. He laughs again, and the nasty laugh admits I'm slyer than he guessed. He's crazy. I understand him all right. Make no mistake. Understand his lunatic theory of matter and mind, the chilly intellect, the hot imagination, blocks and builder, reality as stress. Nevertheless, it was by accident that he got my arm behind me. He penetrated no mysteries. He was lucky. If I'd known he was awake, if I'd known there was blood on the floor when I gave him that kick. The room goes suddenly white, as if struck by lightning. I stare down, amazed. He has torn off my arm at the shoulder. Blood pours down where the limb was. I cry. I bawl like a baby. He stretches his blinding white wings and breathes out fire. I run for the door and throw it. I move like wind. I stumble and fall. Get up again. I'll die. I howl. The night is aflame with winged men. No, no, think. I come suddenly awake once more from the nightmare. Darkness. I really will die. Every rock, every tree, every crystal of snow cries out cold-blooded objectness. Cold. Sharp outlines, everything around me, distinct, detached as dead men. I understand. Mama, I bellow. Mama, Mama, I am dying. But her love is history. His whispering follows me into the woods, though I have outrun him. It was an accident, I bellow back. I will cling to what is true. Blind, mindless, mechanical, mere logic of chance. I am weak from loss of blood. No one follows me now. I stumble again, and with my one weak arm I cling to the huge twisted roots of an oak. I look down past stars to a terrifying darkness. I seem to recognize the place, but it's impossible. Accident, I whisper. I will fall. I seem to desire the fall, and though I fight it with all my will, I know in advance that I can't win. Standing baffled, quaking with fear, 
three feet from the edge of a nightmare cliff. I find myself incredibly moving toward it. I look down, down into bottomless blackness, feeling the dark power moving in me like an ocean current, some monster inside me, deep sea wonder, dread night monarch, a stir in his cave, moving me slowly to my voluntary tumble into death. Again, sight clears. I am slick with blood. I discover I no longer feel pain. Animals gather around me, enemies of old, to watch me die. I give them what I hope will appear a sheepish smile. My heart booms terror. Will the last of my life slide out if I let out breath? They watch with mindless, indifferent eyes, as calm and midnight black as the chasm below me. Is it joy I feel? They watch on, evil, incredibly stupid, enjoying my destruction. Poor Grendel's had an accident, I whisper. So may you all. The End You've been listening to Grendel by John Gardner, narrated by George Guidel.